Again, the book of Revelation is the only book of the Bible, or of the scripture, of the Judeo-Christian canon, that contains a special promise for reading it. Now, all of God's word is a blessing, for sure, but Jesus specifies the book of Revelation has a special promise. It deals with our blessed hope, his return, the rapture and resurrection and the events leading up to it, but it also warns of what is going to precede his return. The themes and motifs of the book of Revelation are drawn largely from the Old Testament. The book of Revelation is the most Judaic book of the New Testament. It's more Jewish in its character and in its motifs and literary themes than any other book in the New Testament. We have to understand it from the perspective of the Old Testament. There's much we can say about the book of Revelation, but one of the most important Old Testament books that comes into play in the book of Revelation is undoubtedly the book of the Hebrew prophet Zechariah. Zechariah. Well, let's understand certain things concerning Zechariah before we read from Zechariah chapters 4 and 5. When approaching a book of the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, although it applies to the New, the first thing we have to understand is the name of the book. The name of the book always means something about the book itself. In this case, it's the name of the Hebrew prophet to whom authorship is attributed, Zechariah. The names of Israel's prophets and patriarchs, etc., indicate something about their character and or their mission. Zechariah's name means in Hebrew, the treasure or the treasury, the treasure of Yahweh. That's the concept. That's the frame we put it in. The first thing we have to understand is the meaning of the name of the book, which in this case is the meaning of Zechariah's personal name, and it has to do with the treasure of God in some way. Like all of Israel's prophets, like all of them, Zechariah prophesied for three different time frames. He prophesied for the first coming of Christ, he prophesied for the second coming of Christ, but first of all, he prophesied for his own time. When we look at the prophets' own time, the history of their time, and the cultural and life situation of their time, it's what theologians in German call the Sitzemleben. The Sitzemleben. We must understand the Sitzemleben. Unless we understand what the book meant for its own time, we cannot understand what it means for our time or for a future time. Again, he is prophesying on three different levels. He's prophesying for his own time. He's prophesying for the first coming of Jesus. And he's prophesying for the return of Jesus. We therefore must ask when we read a passage of Zechariah, what is for his own time? What is for the first coming of Christ? And what is for the second coming of Christ? Or possibly, what is for some combination? Because some of the prophecies have more than one meaning. They are doubly referenced or may have multiple fulfillments. Seems complicated. The illumination of the Holy Spirit is imperative, but we must study to show ourselves approved. When is Zechariah speaking for his own time? When is he speaking about the first coming of Jesus? And when is he speaking about the return of Jesus? We see prophecies plainly about the first coming of Christ. Jesus coming riding on a donkey. We see prophecies about Jesus being betrayed in Zechariah 11 for 30 pieces of silver. But then we see prophecies clearly about his return in chapters 12, 13, and 14, culminating 
with the establishment of the Messianic Kingdom, the Millennium, in which the Feast of Tabernacles will be celebrated in Jerusalem. But first of all, he's speaking for his own time. Then we have to understand 1 Corinthians 10, verses 6 and 11, and Romans chapter 15 both tell us that the Old Testament was written for the church as well as the Jews. Two mistakes. Do not say the church is Israel. It is not. Whatever it means for the church does not negate or replace what it means for Israel. On the contrary, it's for Israel and the Jews first. Only when we understand what it means for them, for Israel, can we understand what it means for the church. So we have to ask, what is for Israel and the Jews? What is for the church? And what is for both? What is for Zechariah's own time? What is for the first coming of Jesus? What is for the second coming of Jesus? Or what is for some combination of those things? It's in a literary genre called apocalyptic. Much like the book of Daniel, much like most of the book of Ezekiel, much like the book of Revelation, which is New Testament apocalyptic. When we read apocalyptic literature, we have to ask the question, what is literal, what is symbolic, and what is both? That's the third stage. What's for his first coming? What's for his second coming? What's for Zechariah's own time? Or what's for some combination? What's for Israel? What's for the church? Or what's for both? What is literal? What is figurative and symbolic? Or what is both? We have to understand these things. Unless we understand Zechariah, we won't understand Revelation. Unless we understand Revelation, we will not understand how to prepare for the coming of Jesus. Well, let's continue. After prayer, the most important principle in understanding biblical prophecy and end times prophecy, eschatology, is history. Unless we understand what did happen, we are never going to understand what is going to happen. In the Western way of thinking, prophecy is a prediction and a fulfillment. Scripturally, prophecy is a pattern with multiple fulfillments. And one final ultimate fulfillment, of which the other fulfillments are shadows or types. More about this at a future time. Let's begin with Zechariah himself. Zechariah is a post-captivity prophet. When the Jews come back from Babylon is when he writes. He's broadly contemporary, or he's in the same age with Haggai, Ezra, and Nehemiah the post-captivity prophets. The book of Zechariah has strong resemblances to Revelation, to Daniel, and to the book of Job. All of these books, and in apocalyptic literature generally, you see the eternal linked to the temporal. You see a connection between the events happening, transpiring on the earth, in time, in space, in history, with what's happening in heaven. In the book of Job, you see Satan accusing Job before the throne. In Zechariah, you see Satan before the throne, accusing Zerubbabel and Yeshua. Zechariah is showing something you see in Revelation, something you see in Daniel, something you see in Job. We struggle not against flesh and blood, 
the events that are happening here on earth in time, the opposition we face, are simply a reflection of a conflict happening in heaven between God and the devil, between light and dark, between good and evil, between the Lord and his angels led by Michael, and between Satan and his demons. This is what we see in Zechariah. Connecting the eternal with the temporal. Well, let's understand this further now. As predicted, the Jews go into the Babylonian captivity in 585 BC. The people rejected the warnings to repent of Joel, of Isaiah, of Micah, of Jeremiah, and finally Ezekiel, it all happens. Isaiah and Jeremiah basically predict the captivity would be 70 years, as Daniel reports. After the 70 years, the Israelites returned from Babylon. The 10 northern tribes went into the Assyrian captivity in 720-721 BC. Some of them came back with the tribes of Judah and Benjamin after the captivity. But only a small number returned. A large Jewish diaspora remained living in the nations outside of Israel. Among those who come back are the prophets Haggai, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Zechariah. Haggai, Ezra, and Nehemiah are keen to see Jerusalem restored and the temple rebuilt. They get opposition from Sambalat, from the Horonites, from the Samaritans, from the pagans, and also from the reluctance of the people themselves who were more concerned with their own lives and their own personal interests than they were in restoring the house of God. This is what Ezra, Nehemiah, and Haggai are up against. What Zechariah does is shows us what is happening in heaven at the same time. This is the meaning of the word apocalyptic. Apocalyptic means, in Greek, apocalypsis, unveiling, lifting up the curtain. There's no new revelation. There's no new doctrine. It's all in Scripture. What does happen, however, the closer we get to the return of Jesus, the curtain goes up for the faithful people to see clearer and clearer. The books of Revelation, Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, the apocalyptic literature will become clearer and clearer to the faithful Christians before Jesus comes. At the same time, we're told something else. The wise virgins needed oil in their lamps to see when the bridegroom was coming. The final church before he comes is Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3. Laodicea was blind. Jesus warns the faithful people in Laodicea to buy sob to anoint your eyes that you may see. Daniel tells us none of the wicked will understand. When the Antichrist arrives on the scene, when these prophecies are fulfilled, the wicked will not understand. In the last days, understanding the scriptures and understanding what's happening in light of the scriptures, comprehending prophecy in light of the Word of God and its predictions, will be a barometer of faithfulness. The gauge of faithfulness will be understanding. The faithful church will understand clearer and clearer. The harlot church, the apostate church, will understand less and less. Apocalypsis. For the faithful believers who love Jesus and are looking for him to return, the curtain is going to go up. They're going to see more and more. For the harlot church, the curtain is going to go down. 
they are going to see less and less. That is why, even among churches and denominations, where you had a much stronger level of biblical understanding a generation ago, churches like the Brethren, churches like the Baptists, who had a stronger understanding of the Word of God, at least a stronger emphasis on things like scholarship or on Bible study, even those churches are not what they were a generation ago. The lamp is growing dim, tragically and unfortunately. They're seeing less and less. Hyper-charismatics and extreme Pentecostals, and I'm a Pentecostal myself, a moderate one, they're basing their doctrine more and more on experience and on things that are basically occult mysticism, which they falsely imagine to be the Holy Spirit, because they're understanding the Word of God less and less. Not only that, but Satan does not want us to be ready for the return of Jesus. So he raises up false teachers and false prophets. Jesus warns us in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. He tells us twice, be alert, watch out for these signs, watch out for these prophecies. Rick Warren, on his website, teaches us, Avoid end time prophecy, it's a diversion. And he distorts Acts chapter 1 out of all context to teach people this lie. Jesus says to be alert, watch out for these things. Rick Warren says, forget what Jesus Christ said, who cares what Jesus said, listen to me, avoid this stuff. You can either believe the New Testament or the purpose driven lie. You can either pay attention to Jesus Christ or you can pay attention to Rick Warren. You can follow Jesus, or you can follow Rick Warren, but you cannot follow both. One of them is a liar, and one of them is telling the truth. Jesus said, be alert, watch for these things. Rick Warren says, keep away from it. Why? The curtain is going down. You see people following Rick Warren's ideas, like Mark Driscoll in America who likes to use vulgar language from the pulpit, mocking Christians who study end-time prophecy, saying they're all conspiracy theorists obsessed with the Illuminati. They're not all like that. Why is Mark Driscoll teaching these things? Why does Tony Campola blame Christians who study end-time prophecy for the world's problems? Why are they teaching things directly contrary to what Jesus commanded us. Because for the heart of the church, the curtain is going down. A generation ago, when born-again Christians said, the heart of the church, it was understood in popular Christian colloquialism the Harlow Church was the Roman Church, or the Eastern Orthodox Church, or the World Council of Churches, the Liberal Protestants, or a cult like the Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses. Today, the Harlow Church is most of mainstream Pentecostalism. Today, the Harlow Church is the Baptist Union in the UK. Today, the Harlow Church but things like the Elam movement, churches that were at one time true churches that have now become increasingly, increasingly alien to the teaching of the Word of God. The curtain goes down. For the faithful church, the curtain goes up. Zechariah lifts the curtain. When these conflicts are happening with Ezra, Nehemiah, and Haggai, Zechariah shows us what's happening in the heavenlies at the same time. One of the reasons there will be a new heaven and a new earth is because Satan has access to the present one. He accuses the brethren. He will not be able to do that in the new heaven. He'll be cast down to earth and he will indwell the Antichrist counterfeiting the incarnation of Jesus. The book of Revelation deals with this.
But to understand that, we have to begin with Zechariah. So, the Jews come back from Babylon. We must understand the concept of Babylon. Babylon goes back to Nimrod and Semiramis with the building of the Tower of Babel. It is the false religious system of the world in league with the world's corrupt political economic system. It begins with the Tower of Babel. It has its Old Testament apex in the Babylonian Empire at the time of the Babylonian captivity. But it continues into the New Testament. Luther correctly identified the medieval papacy as Babylonian. He wrote a treatise called The Babylonian Captivity of the Church because Peter, closing his first epistle, writing from Rome, says, She who was in Babylon greets you. Why? When the Babylonian Empire fell, as Isaiah predicted, as Isaiah prophesied in chapters 44 and 45, the priests of Babylon, all 300 of the official priestly caste of Babylon, migrated in unison to Pergamum, a place where Jesus would say, where Satan dwells, where Satan's throne is. That's where the altar of Zeus would be built, its capstones are today in Berlin. Separate story, but deep meaning in itself, as well as prophetic significance. They came to Pergamum. From Pergamum, the mystery religions of Babylon found their way into the Greco-Roman world, ultimately into the pantheon of Rome. From there, it came into Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, Freemasonry, etc. But the source is always Babylon. Peter understood this for his day. Certainly, the Apostle John, writing the woman on seven hills, is a great city, was writing about Rome, identifying her as Babylon. Luther came to understand this. What's important about Babylon is the following. It is indeed of prophetic significance that the countries that were at the center of world events in the Bible are at the center of world events once again. This is true. Pick up a newspaper. It's Egypt. It's Israel. It's Syria. It's Iraq. It's Iran. Those are the countries at the center of events in Scripture. Those are the countries at the center of events once again. This is significant. Concerning Babylon, however, the way I would explain it is this. In my native New York, we have the theaters called Broadway. Originally, the Broadway theaters were all on Broadway, a street. Now only a few theaters are actually situated on Broadway. Most of the theaters are on the side streets that run off of Broadway, yet it's still called Broadway. The original New York Stock Exchange, the entrance was on Wall Street. Today the entrance is on Broad Street, but they still call it Wall Street. In London, the original headquarters of the Metropolitan Police was on a little alleyway called Scotland Yard. Today it's located a half mile away on Victoria Street but the headquarters of the police is still called Scotland Yard. The location, the original location of the institution is a metaphor for the institution itself. Thus, Babylon could be in Rome. Luther was correct. Peter was correct. It is not the location, it's the institution. All of these Babylons that we see in Scripture, dating back to the Tower of Babel, 
certainly the Babylonian captivity, are pictures, are foreshadows of what the book of Revelation calls Babylon the Great. There will be a confederation of the world's corrupt political system in league with its corrupt religious system, together with its economic system. This will be Babylon the Great and will set the stage for the Antichrist. The prophet Daniel tells us the countries that were in the Roman Empire will reconfederate into a non-democratic Europe and be a part of it. You're seeing this even now. Let's understand Denmark. Denmark has two advantages. One, Denmark was never part of the Roman Empire. And two, Denmark does not have the Euro. But let's look at a map of Europe. What does somebody in Poland, a Slavic country, somebody in Ireland, a Celtic country, somebody in Portugal, a Latin country, and somebody in Austria, a Germanic country, have in common? Language? No. History? No. Culture? No. Cuisine? No. The only thing they have in common is Roman Catholicism. There is an agenda to reverse the Reformation. To bring Protestantism back into union with Rome. In the name of religious unity. <coughs> in fact, all they're doing is using it politically to bring about this artificial union of trying to make the iron stick to the clay that Daniel warned about. Fortunately for Denmark, you don't have the euro, you were never in the Roman Empire, and you don't have a lot of Roman Catholics. These are all to your advantage. I hope to God your country gets out of the European Union, because the EU is the embryo of what Daniel saw coming. But this is the Babylon of the captivity. And it's a picture of Babylon the Great. So, arrives Zechariah. He lifts up the curtain and he shows us what is happening. In the book of Revelation, we have chapter 11 and the two witnesses. People often ask, who are these? Some people say it's Moses and Elijah, others Moses and Enoch, others say one of the witnesses is the Apostle John. A view held by some Christians in the Middle East. The fact is, many people foreshadow those two witnesses. The two angels who rescued Lot and his family, which is a picture of the rapture, foreshadow those two witnesses. The two spies who rescued Rahab and her family foreshadow those two witnesses. So, however, do two figures from the book of Zechariah. Look with me to Zechariah chapter 4, please. I'm reading from Zechariah. It will begin, please, in verse 1. Then the angel who was speaking with me returned and roused me as a man who was awakened from his sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? And I said, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold, with its bowl on the top of it, and seven lamps on it, the same as the appearance of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. 
with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on top of it. Also two olive trees by it. One on the right and one on the left. Then I said to the angel who was speaking with me saying, What are these my Lord? So the angel who was speaking with me answered and said, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by spirit, says the Lord. What are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you will become a plain, and he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace in it. Also the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands will finish it. Let us skip down to verse 11. Then I said to him, What are the two olive trees on the right and on the left of the lampstand? And I answered the second time, and he said, What are the two olive branches which are next to the two golden pipes? which empty the golden oil from them and from themselves. And so he answered me, saying, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said, These are the two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord of the earth. These two witnesses correspond to Zerubbabel and to Yeshua. Not Jesus Yeshua, but another Yeshua of the same name, who was a descendant of the high priest, the priesthood having been lost by the captivity. The other is Zerubbabel, a descendant of the line of the Davidic kings, the kings from the house of David. So we see these two, witnesses before the Lord. In the previous chapter 3, he showed me Yeshua the high priest standing before the angel and Satan standing at the right to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord has chosen Jerusalem. So there he is. We see Yehoshua Yeshua, the son of the priest, standing there, being accused by Satan, which resembles very much the book of Job. In addition to Yeshua, we see the other of the two olive branches. He is, again, Zerubbabel of chapter 4. Now, how do these two characters from the book of Zechariah teach about these two witnesses in the book of Revelation chapter 11 let's look at Revelation 11 In Revelation, we see a reconstructed tribulational temple in which the image of the Antichrist will be set up according to Daniel and Paul in 2 Thessalonians. Then were given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar, and those who worship in it. Leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it. For it's been given to the nations, and they will tread it underfoot for 42 months. Story goes on. But then what happens? We see in verse 4, My two witnesses, they'll prophesy 1260 days, three and a half lunar years. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone wants to harm them, 
Fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. Very similar to Elijah. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. We're told that these two witnesses are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. What we see in Zechariah is what we see in Revelation. These correspond to Zerubbabel and Yeshua. Zerubbabel and Yeshua teach about them. Once more, one was a king and one was a priest by descent, not by office. Well, let's understand this further and how this works. A king had to be a descendant of David. The high priest had to be a descendant of Aaron. One had to be from the tribe of Judah, the other had to be from the tribe of Levi. A priest could not be a king, a king could not be a priest. When one priest tried to be king, John Hyrcanus, it brought disaster to the nation in the Hasmonean period. He was a priest who became king. But then there was a king who burned incense in the temple and God smote him with leprosy. The two had to be separate. Only the Messiah could be both a king and a priest. We have to understand this. When Jesus hung on the cross atoning for our sin, he was the high priest making blood atonement on the altar. But Pilate put up the sign, Jesus Christ, King of the Jews. Only the Messiah could be both king and priest. In Christ, we are all kings and we're all priests. Only Jesus is the high priest, and he's the king of kings, the Melech Hamlachim in Hebrew. So we have a priestly and a kingly lampstand, olive branch. The Antichrist and false prophet are going to mimic, counterfeit the miracles of these two witnesses who are going to replay the deeds of Elijah, obviously, in some way. But let's go further. Turn with me, please, to the book of Ezra. Ezra. Remember, Ezra is contemporary with Zechariah. Ezra is showing us what's happening on earth, Zechariah is showing us what's really happening in heaven at the same time. In the fourth chapter of Ezra, verse 1, we read the following. Now when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building a temple to the Lord, God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel, and the heads of the father's household and said to them, Let us build with you. We, like you, seek your God. We've been sacrificing to him since the days of Esad Hadon, king of Assyria, who brought us up here. But Zerubbabel and Yeshua and the rest of the heads of the father's households of Israel said to them, you have nothing in common with us in building a house to our God. Well, here's quite a thing. The temple's being rebuilt, and there's an attempted interfaith movement. Those who were really their enemies were saying, We have the same God as you. The Samaritans were a hybrid of Assyrian colonists who intermarried with remaining Israelites in the ten northern tribes. They mixed paganism with the Torah and they changed certain portions of the Torah so that Mount Gedizim would be the holy mountain instead of Mount Zion. This is the background to John chapter 4 with Jesus and the woman at the well. They looked like Israelites. 
they mimicked the faith of the Torah, but it was paganized, much like Roman Catholicism, as even Luther understood. It mimics Christianity, but most of it comes from paganism. Cardinal John Henry Newman, the leading Roman Catholic theologian in the English-speaking world of the 20th century, said in his treatise he wrote the development of the Christian religion, at least 70% of the rites, rituals, customs, and traditions of the Roman Catholic Church are of pagan origin. That's John Henry Newman. This hybrid of the pagan and the scripture. That's what the Samaritans did. Let us build with you. We have the same God. Well, you see that today in the ecumenical agenda. Let us build with you. Forget what Luther said. <laughs> Forget what the New Testament says. <clears throat> so what if we believe you're going to atone for your own sin in purgatory? Forget about the fact that the gospel says the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. No, we believe you're going to atone for your own. But let's not worry about the gospel. Forget about the fact that Paul said if even an angel of God comes with another gospel, let it be accursed, anathemized. Let's build with you. Let's unite. This is going to happen in the future. It's happening today with the ecumenical movement. It's happening today with deceivers like Rick Warren. Rick Warren has his global peace plan. He actually says, we have to unite with people of faith. It doesn't matter what God they have faith in or what their religion is. As long as they have faith, we can unite with them to bring in global peace. The scriptures say, no Christ, no peace. Moses warns other gods are demons. Shadim in Hebrew. Paul says other gods are demons. The Manoi in Greek. Rick Warren says, it doesn't matter if they worship demons. We can unite with Hindus. So what if Ari Krishna is a demon? Or Rama or Shitra are demons? So what if Allah is a demon, the Nabataean moon god? It's not really the god of Christians and Jews. We can unite with demon worshippers, says Rick Warren. The New Testament warns us, if somebody has another Christ, don't believe it! Forget about that, says Rick Warren. We can unite with people who have another Christ. The New Testament teaches that Jesus is the monogenes, the only begotten of the Father. The Book of Mormon says that Jesus is the spirit brother of Satan. How can he be the only begotten if he has a brother who's Satan? The Mormon Jesus is not our Jesus. Our Jesus said that he's going to return the same way he left. He warns us, if anybody says, I've come back physically, don't believe it. I'll come back physically the way I left. One day he will return via Mount Sair, and his feet will stand on Mount of Olives. How does I team in Jerusalem? That is true. But he warns us, if anybody says I've come back, don't believe it. From the inner rooms, don't go there. If he's in the wilderness, keep away. If anybody says Christ has returned physically, get away from them. Well, Roman Catholicism says, every time there's a Mass, Jesus returns physically. That the bread and wine are transubstantiated into the physical, literal presence of Jesus Christ. They worship the bread and wine as Christ. Then they kill him again sacramentally, because they don't believe his blood cleanses from all sin, he has to die again. And then they eat him cannibalistically, drinking his blood. Now in Acts 15, the apostles condemned the consumption of blood. It's a demonic pagan practice. The apostles say don't do it. It's vampire religion. It's cannibalism. You understand the Protestant reformers understood this. Even Luther, who believed in consubstantiation and a literal presence, did not believe in transubstantiation. 
He didn't believe that the bread and wine was actually Jesus to be worshipped, that it physically became him protoplasmically under the appearances of bread and wine. A nonsensical belief that was based on the debunked theory of accidents of Aristotle's view of physics and chemistry, disproved by modern science. Absolute nonsense. The Eucharistic Jesus of Rome is a different Jesus. The Mormon Jesus is a different Jesus. The Jehovah's Witness Jesus is a different Jesus. They say he's an angel. We have to unite with them, says Rick Warren. A false unity. Let us build with you! That is going to happen in Revelation chapter 11. The two witnesses will confront this. This attempt for the people of God to unite with false Christianity and false religions. Rick Warren is controlled by the spirit of Antichrist. He's a son of Babylon. The two witnesses will confront this kind of thing that Rick Warren represents, but the worst is yet to come with the Antichrist. Rick Warren is simply an agent of Satan helping prepare the way for the Antichrist. But let's go further with this. It happens at a time when the temple is being rebuilt. This teaches something about Revelation 11. The future is always in the past. Unless we understand history, we will not understand prophecy. This is chapter 4. Now, let's continue looking at chapter 5.